Well, I guess it shows, Mike, how long we've both been around, if you don't mind me saying, because I get another opportunity to start one of these podcasts by talking about your son. You're a former player in the OHL, but your son now also in the league. Can we start with talking a little bit about Porter, first rounder to the Sting, now playing with Mississauga? Sure. Yeah, no, it's uh, it's great. You know, it's uh, one thing living it, and it's another thing, uh, you know, getting an opportunity to watch, uh, you know, your son or daughter go through uh, and play the game that uh, that you love so much. He goes in the first round. You went in the third when you were drafted by the Peets. Should we read anything into that? Uh, he, he, he reminds <laughs> me of that all the time. <laughs> Was there ever any doubt? I mean, he grew up around hockey, I would guess, to some degree. Was there ever any doubt that he'd be pursuing it to this level? Uh, you know what? He, he loved uh, both my kids just, uh, you know, really loved the, the game and had a passion for it at a young age. And, you know, we're fortunate. We grew up, uh, you know, where they grew up, it's, uh, we back on to uh, a pond and uh, and it freezes over in the winter. So, you know, it started at a young age and uh, you could just see them, you know, growing and, uh, and uh, loving the game every year it goes by. What's tougher? Mike, is it tougher being a player involved in a championship game, which you've been in plenty of, or being a parent watching your kid play and trying not to get too emotionally involved? <laughs> That's funny. Were you talking to someone from North Bay yesterday or what? <laughs> no, you know what? That's a funny question because uh, when you're playing the game, you don't have time to think, right? And you just play and you, you know, you just, uh, you just act and, uh, and it comes natural to you, but you know, you're sitting up there in the stands and, uh, you know, you're sitting beside someone who's uh, who's yelling at uh, at your son or, or whatever. You know, it's it's part of the game and it is, uh, you know, you just sort of got to bite your tongue a little bit and then sit back and enjoy it as a fan. But no, it's uh, it's a lot of fun watching. And, uh, you know, I definitely think it's tougher watching than it is playing. That's for sure. So what sparked your love? Of the game, any? I mean, as a Sioux native, you had outdoor ice like nine months of the year or something, right? So, <laughs> <laughs> so you've been up there in the winter, eh? <laughs> I have been, yes, sir. <laughs> yeah, you know that's it right there. You know, every uh, every school, um, every neighborhood had a rink. Um, you know, and we just walk down the street and have a game of shinny on the the outdoor rink, and uh, you know it lasted for a long time, and uh, so we're able to get out there and just uh, enjoy the game the way it uh, was was originally meant to be and then as I got older um, there's a guy named Mike Zook he was assistant coach for the Greyhounds uh, he was a legend in, in Sault Ste. Marie and he he had the best rink in, in the Sioux and so everyone would do would travel from all ends of the city to uh, to meet at this rink and they were big games right and so you'd be able to go in and then write uh, whoever won the most consecutive games an opportunity to write it on the inside because you had an old wood stove in there too. And so uh, you could be sitting there for, you know, hours waiting to get your turn. But as soon as you got in there and you started winning, you just kept playing. So <laughs> that was, uh, that started the love for it. And uh, it's just continued on since then. That is fantastic. And I know that you're a Peterborough guy now through and through, but with those roots in the Sioux and you mentioned Mike Zook and the stuff of legend and the Greyhounds, I mean, they are synonymous with the city, the Greyhounds and Sault Ste. Marie. Yeah, you know what? I, I, I was lucky. So I uh, I think I, you know, grew up in, in, in Sault Ste. Marie and now I live in Peterborough, two of the best junior uh, hockey towns in the CHL, I believe. I haven't been to all of them, but, um, you know, it's they just love their, their junior teams. And, uh, you know, I was fortunate enough to grow up, you know, watching the Greyhounds play. And then I got drafted to Peterborough. Uh, fortunate to go to a great organization um, here and uh, now you know I'm able to you know go to the go to the games every Thursday with my dad and uh, bring my kids there and watch the game and uh, you know we're lucky and sometimes you take it for granted but uh, you know growing up in a junior town like this it's uh, it's special that's for sure. You know I'm born and raised in Kitchener obviously my work now in the OHL is broadcasting Rangers games but I agree completely with the, what you just said about those two markets, specifically Peterborough and Sault Ste. Marie. They're pretty special when it comes to junior hockey, for sure. Oh, lots of history and uh, tradition. And you just can't, but, uh, you, you know, sometimes you do take it for granted, though, because, uh, you know, I was at the, at the game on, on Thursday, and, and when you sit around and, and you look around and you see the fans that we have, and it was, a, you know, packed barn and, 
you know, people know their hockey, the guy in front of me, you know, hitting the seat and up cheering and, you know, some, you don't get that in every city. So, um, you know, sometimes you do take it for granted, but you just get that feeling when you go into that rink at the MEM Center and, uh, you know, all the people around and, and the square corners and all that fun <laughs> stuff that <laughs> P.R.O. brings. And uh, it's a special spot, that's for sure. Did that give you fits as a defenseman or is it harder on the goalies? I'm thinking maybe on you. Well, I think both. You never know what's going to happen. I know some people say that, uh, you know, you, in Peterborough, they practice the dumpings and whatnot. You do know the bounce and it's going to come out to the slot sometimes, but it's not always a true bounce, right? So it keeps you on your toes and it's just something, uh, you know, that's unique to this rink. And every rink, you know, has something unique to it. And, and you remember, you know, going into the different rinks. Uh, and that's just one that's here. I was watching the Zamboni go around uh, in the intermission and it didn't even touch the corners. Now I remember back in the day, there used to be someone come out with a little watering can to, to water the corners, but I don't know, they just don't do it now. And uh, it's just, uh, you know, something you got to live with coming into Peterborough to play the Peets. Was there another barn that you remember either for good reasons or bad that you would play in when you were, Oof. when you were in junior? Windsor. Yeah. <laughs> Why does that one always come up, Marty? It always comes up. <laughs> I'm sure you remember the, the you know, the fans behind uh, the home uh, team's goalie there just hanging over the glass. Um, you know, that was, that was a good one. It was always nice going back to the Sioux, you know, playing at the gardens there. Um, and, and the Sioux's new rink, it's, uh, you know, I've watched a few games there and it's just, it's just nice. I, I, I like the layout of it. And then, you know, Kitchener. Right. Like, as you know, it's just, you know, Porter got to play his first OHL game there and and you get there and it's just what a what a spot to, uh, you know, to play in, especially as a young rookie, just looking up and seeing all those fans, uh, you know, at the in catcher there. They uh, that's another classic rank for sure. As a Sioux native and then being drafted into the OHL with the Peterborough Peets. Given the timeline, Mike, you would have been, I mean, it would have been just after the Super Series when when the Sioux knocks the Peets out and, and wins the Memorial Cup on home ice. Did you feel like you must have had the hometown attachment to the Greyhounds and all of a sudden it must feel like you're going to the enemy or something? Yeah. <laughs> there, you know what? There's, there's, uh, so during that uh, the Memorial Cup, I was actually a flag bearer for, I can't remember, for the opening ceremonies. So I'm out there, you know, holding a flag. I think I was holding Laval's flag because every team was represented out there. So I'm a fan out there holding that, that the flag out for the opening ceremonies, you know, standing out on the ice. And then you fast forward two years and, and all of a sudden now you're playing in the league, but not just in the league, you're playing for Peterborough. And, uh, you know, it is, it was quite the rivalry and uh, you know what, it was, uh, it was special. That's for sure. What was it like? Do you have a did you have a welcome to the OHL moment with the Peets when you realized, okay, I'm here, or maybe something is like, wow, this is a different level of hockey for me? Well, yeah, obviously playing against Oshawa, right? Because the rivalry rivalry was really big back then. Still, it was, uh, you know, when I when I first got in the league, and and when you go into you know Oshawa's barn or they came here. You know, you were told, you know, by the by the veterans, you knew that there was that uh, that rivalry and that, you know, that hatred towards each other. But when you got thrown in a game, you felt it, too. And it was, you know, an absolute war on the ice. And, uh, you know, you wouldn't want it any different. Like that was a great uh, introduction to the league. And you thought, holy moly, if this is the way it's going to go, it's going to be a, a long season. Right. But that's just the way you play and you learn how to play the right way. And uh you know, it's definitely, uh, you know, that, that Oshawa Peter O'Reilly rivalry is what, uh, what was my uh, sort of welcome to the league wake up I, call. I still say it's the best one this league has ever seen and, and probably will ever see. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I agree because, uh, you know, I lived it, um, you know, <laughs> you got many... the bruises to prove it. Yeah, you know, what's funny, funny story. So, you know, John Tripp and myself had a few run-ins, right? And the one, you know, it was in a line brawl and uh, I picked the wrong guy to fight in a, in, in a line brawl. <laughs> anyway, so we got into it, you know, he took a few runs at me, dumped it in my corner a few times. So we had a few run-ins and uh, I don't know, about a month ago, I'm, I'm sitting in uh, Kingston watching the game 
And uh, John Tripp invites me up to his box to go watch the game up there. So it's like, this is perfect. It's funny how the hockey world, it's a small world. And uh, there I am sitting up there in the box watching uh, Mississauga play, take on uh, Kingston. That's amazing. I love it. And it is such a small world. You're so connected. I mean, heck, the reason you and I are talking today is because of Troy Smith and Sean Snyder and Jeff Tui and so many others that we've been connected to mutually without meeting each other yet. Yeah, that's right. And I mean, that's why you put your kids in hockey, right? Or, or sports in general. Um, you know, the friends that you meet, it's, uh, you know, it's amazing. I mean, the, the one, someone I play with, Bob Woods used to say, you know, the, it's really like that Garth Brooks song, I have friends in low places, because <laughs> it doesn't matter where you go, you know, there's always a connection to someone on a hockey team. And uh, like you said, you've probably seen it going into different arenas, you know, even maybe even just going away in the summer and, and you get talking to someone and, uh, you know, you have a mutual, mutual, uh, you know, friend or, or someone that you played with or someone who knows someone you played with. And, you know, that that's the beauty of, uh, of playing sport. That's for sure. Do you remember showing up for your first fitness testing with the Peterborough Peets? Yeah, I do. I remember because I was drafted by the Pete's and I didn't know if I was going to go NCAA or not because, um, you know, I, I did, I did quite well in school. So it was, I remember I got drafted and then the next week, uh, the next weekend I had to come down here. Um, I don't know if it was fitness testing or it was the banquet, the year end bank or something. Um, but I was supposed to go write my SATs and, so my parents were like, well, you got to make a decision because we're either going to Peterborough or you're going to write your SATs. And so um, at that moment, I said, well, I'm going to I'm going to go give it a shot down there. And uh, we made the eight hour trip down to uh, to Peterborough. And, uh, you know, it was it was it was an eye opener. That's for sure, because, you know, live, growing up in the Sioux, you know, you, you do get around, but you don't get, uh, you know, coming down to Toronto is special. Right. So, you know, this is sort of considered Toronto area when you're in the Sioux. And uh, I, it felt like I was going to like the big city, Peterborough, right? <laughs> Even though it's not big, that much bigger than the Sioux, it just, you know, seemed like, and when I walked in there and, and seen all the guys, you know, you're kind of starstruck in the, in the moment, but uh, you know, it's, uh, it, was, uh, it was quite the experience, that's for sure. Did your dad have to finish a night shift and then drive straight through to get you there? Yeah, that's right. That's right. He uh, he was a bus driver, and so he didn't like taking days off, right? So <laughs> he finished the night shift, and uh, and we uh, we hopped in the car and uh, and took off here. And uh, he uh, it's funny because they live here now. So he uh, I, well, four years ago, my mother and him uh, moved down here and. He goes to the mall and has his coffee and, and, you know, has a bunch of buddies here now. So, you know, you know, when we got here, you know, it was just a good feel. He loved it. You know, we loved it. It was a good spot. And, uh, and yeah, there you go. We, we, uh, we both live down here now. How much of that, like, would you credit to your experiences in Peterborough as a player and maybe what was expected of you by the organization, for example? Yeah, this is one of the best organizations, you know, Jeff Tui, um, you know, I can't say enough good things about him. You know, you, you know, there's my parents. I was 16 at the time, turning 17 you know, at the end of September. So I come down here and, you know, it's just, it's just like, here you go, right? Drop you off and they take off back to the Sioux. And, and, uh, and then you have Jeff Tui looking out for, you know, all these kids, right? And so, you know, he was a GM, but he was, uh, you know, he, he came to my wedding. You know, I still talk to him all the time. You know, he was more than just a GM. And I think that's important with uh, with junior hockey, right? And you have a, you know, you look at the, the GMs, you know, in the league and around the league now. And, and I think the real successful ones, you know, form that relationship with kids. And it's more of more than just like a GM in, in pro, right? You have to be something special, something different. You have to be that one caring you know, adult, but still run a junior hockey team. And uh, I think the GMs that can do that are the successful ones because uh, you're dealing with kids and, uh, you know, it's, uh, you need some more, a little bit more guidance than you do if you're, if you're a GM of an NHL or American League team, that's for sure. Dave McQueen was your first coach in Peterborough. He was also a former guest on this podcast. What was Mac like as a coach? 
Mac was a great coach. You know, he uh, he was an old school coach. He had that raspy old voice, like major league. <laughs> we we'd make fun of him all the time, not to his face though, ever. <laughs> You know, he was still, it was still in that era, right? Like he, uh, you know, he, he demand, he demanded, uh, hard work and, and he still had that little bit of fear, right? So, you know, players still fear, or at least I did anyways. Um, you know, he still had a little bit, you know, had that fear, but a respectful fear. He wasn't, you know, he didn't do anything in order, you know, that to make us fear him, but it was just one of those things. It was respect thing. Um, he demanded a lot. Uh, the one thing I could say that that probably contributed to our success was just the practice the intensity of practices. Like we competed like dogs out there every practice, and he demanded that. Um, and then in the game um, games, he uh, you know everyone had their role, and you accepted your role. And you know if you got outside your role, then he would let you know really quickly. I remember a funny story. He probably I don't know if he remembers this or not, but. Um, after my first year, I was feeling good, right? I was uh, came back in the training camp, and I uh, I scored a few goals in the scrimmages and even in the exhibition games, and I was feeling good. So he, he calls me in the office, and uh, I thought, okay, here I go. I'm going to get some power play time, right? So this is a 95, 96 year. And he goes, you know, sit down. Hey, how's it going? Good. And I'm waiting for you're going to be, you know, get some power play time because I was, you know, putting some points up in, in the preseason. And he goes, let's get one thing straight. The less you have the puck, the better it is for this team this year. I was like, okay, thanks, Dave. See you later. So that was it. I knew my role. <laughs> well, isn't that interesting? All things considered where that year ended. 95 96 right yeah, we'll, we'll right. get to right like that's that's pretty ironic <laughs> yeah, now that's looking right. back <laughs> and and by the way i told this to mac when he was on the podcast you mentioned that fear or intimidation he was coaching in sarnia when i started broadcasting in this league i was scared something about that raspy voice and I the know. presence i'm just like you know what i'll keep my distance from this guy <laughs> oh yeah yeah that's right <laughs> But you know what? When we started winning playoffs, we saw the different side of him, right? Like he was, uh, I think, you know what? As a coach, I think that's, you know, that's his, his thing, right? Like some teachers, you know, they don't smile, right? They don't smile until, you know, two months into into the, I was going to say a new season, but the new semester, the the new school year. And then after they sort of let it down a bit and, uh, and uh, you know, but, you know, that's just, I think that was his thing, right? So, I mean, they do smile, but you know what I mean? Like they just, they're the serious part. And then it's a little bit, uh, you know, you can, uh, you know, come back from that a little bit, um, you know, once you do get the respect from, from any, everyone in front of you. So that 95, 96 season, of course, was the year that the Peets were going to be Memorial Cup hosts. What was it like in the city, putting on that maroon jersey every night, knowing what the ultimate goal was? You know what? It was, it was, it was weird. It was special for sure. It was, it was odd because that year we, we didn't really even know how good we actually were. Um, you know, and I think a lot of credit had to, you know, go out to, you know, Jeff and, and Drummy and, uh, and uh, Dave, because I, like everyone talks about the process, the process, the process now. And, we were actually focusing and doing the process before the process was even a thing. And, uh, and that was to that, that's to their credit. Um, they didn't let us get too ahead of ourselves. You know, they, uh, they kept making sure that, uh, you know, we're, we're focusing on the little things, you know, we weren't reading the newspaper clippings, how good we were. Um, you know, we had a job to do and, and we had, you know, different sort of, uh, you know, steps in order to get there. And I think that, you know, by knowing that we're hosting, it was able to, we were able to set little short-term goals along the way. Um, whereas if you were just in a playoff series and not knowing you're going to make it there, you know, uh, it would have been a little bit different. Um, but by knowing the end result, and this is where we wanted to get there, you know, breaking it down to the steps, it just kept us sort of just, you know, focusing on the next step. And then once we cut that step, then you go to the next step, knowing that we're going to get to the ultimate dance uh, in the end. So it was neat. It was special. And uh, we learned a lot from from that experience. You knew where you were going to go because you were hosts, but you went in, Mike, through 
the front door, as we say. Looking back, though, that's got to be one of not only one of the, the greatest seasons in Pete's history, considering the way the OHL championship ended, but really one of the best championships we saw. Seven games with the Guelph Storm and the road team won every one of them. That's absolutely wild to me. Yeah, it was. You know what? Um, it was just one of those things, right? And that was the type of team that we had. Like, we had a gritty team. We had, uh, you know, a team where everyone accepted their roles. And it wasn't like we're on the road when we're playing. It was, you know, we just played the same. Didn't matter, you know, where we played. Um, and so when we went on the road throughout the, that playoff run, it wasn't a big deal, right? It was just like, okay, yeah, we're just going to play another game. Um, but it was funny because, uh, you know, we come back here game six and everyone was winning on the road. So I don't know whose idea it was, maybe Jeff's idea, but they rented a bus for us like we were going on the road and uh, drove us all around town. And we had the same routine, like as if we we're going into Guelph and then we, you know, got off and we didn't end up winning anyways, but then we, you know, went up there and uh, closed the deal there. And it was, uh, that was really special that, uh, that night. That's not a bad idea. I mean, at that point, you might as well try something, right? Oh, welcome to playoffs, eh? Like all those little things, you know, coaches and uh, teammates try just to, you know, get your, uh, sort of psych yourself up and get your head into the right, uh, into the right uh, space. You know, it was worth a try. It was worth Absolutely. a try. Absolutely. So, <sighs> Considering you couldn't close it out at home, but you'd had all your success in the series on the road anyway. Do you remember traveling back down to Guelph and, you know, what you were feeling in terms of confidence, nerves, anything like that? Yeah, at that point in the playoff run, like, you know, it was just, honestly, there wasn't, there wasn't many nerves at all. Like the nerves were like in round one. And then the further you go in playoffs, there's, the nerves are gone and it's just, now it's a mission, right? And now it's, you're excited to get out there and, and, you know, we're excited to play that game seven. Um, you know, we always knew that we had a team that would never give up. We would never, and it, it happened, you know, you could see it developing over the year. Um, and we were a close team and we just knew that it didn't matter where we were, what game it was, you know, we had, we put ourselves in an opportunity to, to win. Um, and a lot of that has to do with, like I said, the coaching staff there and Jeff, you know, putting the, the pieces together. Like we had some characters on that team. We had some role players. We had some, you know, offensive guys. We had tough guys. We had, uh, you know, solid D. We had checkers. We had, you know, they put, they put uh, you know, a team together that uh, couldn't help but be successful. And then once the team like that uh, comes together and is glued together, it didn't matter. It didn't matter where we were. We were confident that we we're gonna gonna win that one. So fast forward from the beginning of that game seven to the end of period three. Now you're about to head into overtime on the road with the <laughs> OHL championship on the line. Are you too tired to think? Is there did anybody say something memorable like go win one for the Gipper stuff going on? <laughs> <laughs> it was funny. Zach Burke was a quite the character, eh? and he'd always. Uh, he'd always have something going on. Like he was, he is a character. He's, he's loose. He's, he's out there. He's funny. So he'd always throw his mask right to someone. And he'd say, whisper in the mask, whisper to the mask. Who's going to get the winner. Right. And so, he, you know, he threw it over and, and uh, I can't even remember, you know, who was said or, or whatever, but threw the back over the mask back to Burke, he put it on go out there and then uh, end up getting the winner. So it's kind of funny. That's awesome. So that takes us back to Dave McQueen, your coach, and you're coming in, you're feeling pretty good in the preseason. You get that meeting. He says, the less you have your puck, the puck on your stick, the more successful we're going to be. Yeah. What the hell were you doing jumping up in that Russian overtime? How about that for a question? I have no idea. You know, I still don't, I still don't, even know why I, I did it. I, I think I just saw, I just, it was just a reaction. It's just one of those things you don't think about. I saw it was a bad line change. I don't even know how I got out there. Uh, and then I just took off. I was like, I'm going for it. Right. It's uh, it's overtime game seven. I'm going for this. And then uh, I got the pass and now I'm on a breakaway. 
And now I'm like, oh boy, I'm not used to this. And so uh, I ended up just shooting it. And uh, I wasn't deacon at that point, that's for sure. Um, and then for some reason, I don't even know, I don't know if I was celebrating or if I, why I jumped, but I, I ended up running, uh, running into Dan Cluche. And then uh, I thought, oh boy, because I grew up in the Sioux and I saw Dan, you know, fight a few times. He's a tough, tough customer, right? So I thought, well, I better, uh, hopefully I score this or else it's going to turn into a brawl. And I ended up putting it past them. And then, uh, and then that's it. You know, you look at the bench and the whole bench comes, comes at you. It's funny you mentioned that collision with Cluche because I watched the video of your Game 7 OHL Championship overtime winning goal. And that's the second thing I noticed. After the goal, I'm like, man, you really ran into Cluche. I'm not saying you did it on purpose, but there's, I think there's a time today that he might still be lying on the ice, the goalie or something <laughs> like that, after that kind of collision. Yeah, well, I thought it's either going in or, uh, yeah or we'll have to mix something up here, you know, and see what happens. But it, uh, I don't know. I think what I was thinking, I, I'm, I'm shooting a score. And if I don't, I'm going to, you know, maybe try to run, run him to the back of the net and see what happens where we can shake things up a bit. <laughs> <laughs> well, you said a moment ago, you don't even know how you got out there to get on that breakaway and take that pass. But I spoke with, or, or sent a message to your D coach at the oh. time, Brian Drum, Drummy, who's been on this podcast before, and he said, tell Marty it was the D coach that made the big line change to win that OT game in Guelph. <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> right. He gave me the tap and pushed me up the offensive side probably, eh? <laughs> <laughs> Drummy also says, I'm supposed to call you the big chaw and see what the reaction is. Oh boy, because he would always, because it. I grew up, I played in that era, right, when you had the tough guys out there. So he'd always call the other team's tough guy the cha, like who's the big cha on this team? And then, uh, you know, he'd say, who's, who's going to get this cha tonight? Who's going to go after him? And so, uh, yeah, he was quite the character. I, and you know what? He was a key piece to that, uh, to that team. It, it takes a real special person to be assistant coach and junior. And, you know, he he had the respect from us as, as players, but he was there with us. Like he would practice with us. He'd put his equipment on, come out with us. He was he he had our ear. We had his ear. We'd go to him for advice. And knowing that, you know, it wasn't Dave, right? We didn't have to go talk to Dave. And, uh, you know, he helped us grow as individuals. He wanted us to every one of us to succeed. You You really knew, you know, he was he was rooting for you as an individual and you know he, whether it be before practice after practice he's willing to work with us or or a phone call here or go visit him at the farm you know he uh he, he was a special uh, person uh, and once again you know a key piece to that uh, to that puzzle that 1996 championship goal mike almost 30 years later now, and we'll see what the Peets do in the playoffs this year. They've got a heck of a team, but it remains one of the biggest goals in franchise history. How does, how does Mike Martone today feel about the significance of that goal? Yeah. You know what? I thought it was, it was, it just reflects that whole team, right? It, yeah. I, I scored it, but if I didn't score it, I'm, I'm certain someone else would have scored it on our team. You know what I mean? It's just one of those groups that we had. Um, and it was, you know, and anyone, and that was the whole thing about that team. Like everyone respected everyone so much for their own roles and no one, no one was better than anyone else, you know, or no one acted, you know, that they were better than anyone else. And so I really truly believe that it's, it was, uh, it just, it just showed that, you know, the, the closeness that we had and you know whenever anyone brings that up um you know yeah I I you know I was I was fortunate to be the person to finish it but there's so many other things that happened in that game uh you know block shots you know guys you know just grinding it out um you know back checks you know all those little things and uh you know those things go unnoticed but you know, to to a team like like we had there, it's uh, it definitely wasn't no, unnoticed, and um, there were so many things that uh, that went well that night in order for me to put me in that position. Obviously, winning an OHL championship 
puts you into a Memorial Cup. Host or not, you went in through the front door. Uh, you had to play the semifinal game to get through. You did. You you won it. And then Granby gets the better of you in that final on home ice. Uh, how difficult was it, Mike? That was tough. That was really tough. You know, we uh, they've changed the format since then. We we were uh, you know we battled. That semifinal game was huge for Brandon, and uh, it's a grind, right? And uh, having that day off, you know, prior to. Um, you know, we beat Granby in the round robin, you know, we felt good going into it. Um, it's just one of those things, right? Like, it's funny how the game goes and, and momentum switches and, you know, you need a key goal at a certain time or, you know, you need something to spark the team at a certain time. And it just se- didn't seem like we had it that night, you know, and, uh, um, you know, we play them in a series. I don't know. I still think we win in a series, you know, best of seven, but, you know, it's, uh, it's unfortunate that that's, it goes down to one game and not to take anything against them um, because they're a good team too. Um, you know, it was, uh, it was, it was tough, but, you know, being at home, the fans were amazing. You know, I'm sure you heard about the, you know, the fog that was on the ice and we had to skate around to lift the fog. And it was, uh, it was one of those things, you know, when you know you're in a special spot when, uh, you know, you had the fans to celebrate with you. And then uh, when things aren't going well, um, they're there to, you know, help you through it as well. And uh, we got nothing but support, you know, you know, moving forward from that, uh, from that game on. Don't ever change a thing about the Memorial Center. Okay. Fog yeah. or no fog. That barn is one of the best ones we still have in the league. I, I agree with you. And you know what? I was watching the, the Miss Saga came to town. And, uh, my brother-in-law lives in Toronto and, and him and his buddies and family came down and, it was packed in there and they looked around and they said, you know what, this is a special spot. This is. So that's what I mean. We take it for granted sometimes, but you know, when you go in there and, and you know, someone who hasn't been in there and they, they get in there and have that feeling and look around, it is a special spot. You were later uh, presented with the C you were a captain of that Peterborough Pete's organization. You know, we talked earlier about it being one of the best junior hockey organizations in the OHL. I might even add, if not in the CHL, but what does it mean to have that C on your Jersey? It means a lot, you know, there's a lot of, you know, tradition and pride. And, and that's one of the big reasons why I think Peterborough is such a special spot, you know, with the tradition here, it's, uh, you know, it's amazing. And, and you look at some of the guys who, you know, wore the C before you and uh, who even put on the Jersey before you, you know, you just feel like, you know, you have, a duty and obligation to withhold the standards and the culture and the values of this organization. And it's not tough because, you know, by the time you get to see on, you have a good core group of guys that live those values every day. And, uh, you know, one, one guy that really helped me, you know, when I first got here was Brian Thompson. He, uh, he was an OA. Um, he got traded from the Sioux after they won the Memorial cup. And uh, he taught us a lot. Like he didn't win an OHL championship that year uh, because he was gone, but he taught us a lot about what they did in the Sioux and a lot of the team building stuff. And, um, you know, just making sure you have each other's back. And, you know, he taught us a lot of that and a lot of that stuff, you know, you see further on down the road. Um, And it's like, you know, so when you wear that C, you have a little bit of those guys, you know, in that C with you. You know, and so it's uh, and that's why organizations are, are so good uh, that are good, stay good, because you have that core group that's passed down to the next generation. And, you know, the rookies coming in and if you don't fit, then, you know, they get rid of you. Uh, and if you if you don't fit, but you want to learn how to be a Pete, then you're they're willing to teach you. But, um, you know, that's just the way it was. And, uh, you know, is is a nice thing to be a part of and, and to be, uh, be a leader and pass those qualities down. What does it mean to be a Pete? You have to be, you know, someone who's uh, willing to, you know, be a part of this community. Um, you know, it's one of the only, well, not the only, it's a couple, right? Uh, community-based teams out there still. Uh, and it's, it's something special. Like you're, when you're playing for the Peets, you're playing um, not just for, you know, the guy beside you, you know, you're playing for, 
you know, the fans in the stands, you're playing for the people who were here before you, you're playing for, you know, the, the, the small town of Peterborough. Um, and so that's what it means to be a Pete. It's just, you know, something that goes beyond um, the ice and the games. It's, uh, it's how you act within the community, giving back to the community. You know, we, we sort of have, you know, one of those, uh, you know, mentalities of, you know, it's us against everyone, right? And it's a sort of a small market team. And, you know, you go into these other big market spots and you have that uh, motivation that, you know what, we don't need all, all this stuff. We're, we're the Pete's, right? And, uh, and it's a good feeling. It's, uh, it's nice when, you, when you're able to, it's tough to explain, but when you're in that family, in that group, um, it's, uh, it's, you don't need anyone else, right? You got the community behind you and, and uh, you're, that's who you're winning it for right there. You win that OHL championship. Uh, in 96 with the Peets, you get the C on your sweater. And it seems no sooner do you finish your junior career in the O with Peterborough than you're off to the pros and, oh, okay, let's just win a Kelly Cup in the East Coast Hockey League. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, you know what? It's it's like I said, I, I was fortunate enough to be put in that position, but it was sort of like the same you know, values and uh, culture that was in Mississippi. And once again, I was as lucky Bruce Boudreaux was the head coach there and uh, a good buddy of mine, uh, you know, Woody was uh, his assistant coach there. And uh, he, he's, co- he's in uh, Minnesota right now. I think the assistant coach, Bob Woods, he was actually like an old school Reg Dunlop player coach when I, my first year there. Um, but you know what? It was all, a lot of the, a lot of things were similar. So when you go into that environment, um, you know, you're, you're looking at it and it's sort of, you know, something like, oh, I've seen this before. I've seen this culture before. I've seen this, you know, us against them, sort of like a pack mentality. Uh, you know, no one's going to push us around, you know, uh, you know, we'll stick up for each other. And, and, and that work ethic too, like Boudreaux was a coach. He was different than McQueen. Like Boudreaux was more of like a player's coach. Um, you know, he would joke around with us all the time. You know, he... Uh, you wanted, you know, he's one of those guys that you really wanted to go to the wall for too, but if for a different reason, you know, um, however, he did demand a lot as well. And so our practices, we, we battled, we competed and that's, you know, when I'm talking to kids in minor hockey, I just wish they can get out there and see how pros practice because sometimes the practices are harder than the games. The compete level is harder than the games. Uh, and then when it was time to play, it was just, you know, it's just something that we did. It was a routine thing and you go out there and you, you play. You know what that reminds me of, Mike? It reminds me of some of the conversations I had over the years with Jay McKee when he was the coach of Kitchener. And he just talked about the preparation, the practices, a game day and, and the visualization that would happen in the afternoon leading up to game time. And it was all part of the routine almost, but so much goes into it. That's exactly what you made me think of. And it's so true. It's the, the difference between, you know, minor hockey to junior hockey to the pros is, is fairly significant. Yeah, and you're right. And it's just, you learn that as you go. And so, you know, when everyone says, well, you're bringing in an experienced player, you're, you know, experience goes, now I know what experience is because it's tough to teach that, right? And you, as you, as you're growing as a hockey player, you know, I'm learning that stuff from Bob Woods. I'm learning that stuff from, you know, Steve Webb when I was a rookie here, um, you know, Jamie Langenberner, you know, so you come in and you learn a little bit from them and then you move on and you find someone else that's teaching you some. And then before you know it, you know, you're teaching someone else what you've learned from all these other guys. And that's where that experience comes in and, and the preparation and how to prepare as, as a rookie, you don't, you don't know much. Right. And so as you're getting, you know, through it, you're, you're learning a little bit more and more and take what works for you and what doesn't. And hopefully you can pass that on. It's funny. You mentioned Langenberner when I was looking you up on hockey DB and saw him as one of your teammates, things worked out pretty okay for him, huh? (laughs) Yeah. I tell you what, that guy, he taught me how to battle in practice. He taught me how to, how to work. That guy worked harder than anyone. You know, he would run you in practice. He, you know, the battles were intense with him and that's why he was so good. Right. He because when it came to the game time, he's he's already done it. I remember him flying in for the World Juniors. He got in between, flew in, 
to Toronto, got here between the second and third, and somehow he ended up playing for us that night. I don't even know if that's legal, but he did it. <laughs> <laughs> Drummy probably snuck him in or Mac, somebody. I don't know who was at that. Probably Mac still then, not Drummy. Yeah. Yeah. But anyway. <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, that's just the kind of guy he was, you know, and uh, so I learned a lot from him, that's for sure. I just wanted to go back to Bruce Boudreaux for a minute. Obviously, I have zero connection to him other than, you know, watching his body of work. But I was choked up watching that ending for him as unfair as it was in Vancouver. As somebody that played for him and talked about what a player's coach he was, that must have broke your heart to some degree, Mike. Yeah, it did. And you know what? It was um, how he handled it, though. Oh, Um like that, it's just, that's what he taught us, right? Like it's, you can't control what's thrown at you. And there's lots of adversity, especially in playoff runs and whatnot. It's how you handle it. And, uh, you know, that's, that's where he lived. Right. And that's what he taught us. And, and, uh, and he, and he just doesn't say it, right. Like you saw it, he, he, he lived it, he showed it. And, uh, you know, that's, that's just the kind of guy he is. And that's why players love him so much too because there's no pulling any punches with him. You know, he'll tell you the way it is, but he'll also, you know, pat you on the back when you need it and be that person there for you. And, and a sincere, sincere guy, that's for sure. It's just someone who loves the game, loves the game. Yeah. We were kind of joking at the beginning of this. Uh, you were a third rounder into the O in, with Peter Bro. Porter's a first rounder. But you still have one on him. We'll see how things play out <laughs> down the road. You were a fourth rounder into the National Hockey League with the Buffalo Sabres. What did it mean to you? What was what was draft day like when you found out? Draft day was amazing, uh, especially then once we, you know, once again looking back at connections, right? Like Teddy Nolan was he's big in the Sioux, right? And so I grew up watching Teddy and Danny Flynn, uh, you know, coach the Greyhounds there and. I mean, if you get a chance to sit in a room with Teddy Nolan and listen to listen to him and, you know, he's he's a motivator, like you just want to, you know, you know, you just go through a wall for him, right? Like he's got lots of experience. He's got lots of stories um, and you respect him so much. Like I, you know, he's he's well respect, a well respected man, uh, especially around the Sioux. Right. And so, you know, I get drafted by Buffalo and, and he's there. Um, you know, it's, I'm pretty, I'm pretty lucky. I'm pretty happy. Um, it was a special day. It was in St. Louis. I remember my family was there. We, uh, you know, um, it was great. It was, uh, it was lots of fun. Um, and then, uh, you know, the, the, the work starts after that and, uh, you know, it's, it's a grind, but, uh, no, it was, it was special, it was special going to, to Buffalo. That's for sure. Uh, you mentioned Danny Flynn. Now there's another name and boy, if I kept track, Marty, of the names that come up in conversation on this podcast, Danny's might be near the very top. Oh, really? a lot too. Oh, yeah. Uh, and and you end up playing for him at St. FX. Yeah, yeah. And uh, yeah, that was that was special, too, because, you know, it's uh, it's going, you know, when I was finished uh, junior, you know, I want to play pro for a bit. And it was it was at that time you know um, you're you're allowed five years eligibility and I used three years up to play you know pro uh, because I ended up signing um, a contract with Phoenix so as a free agent because Buffalo released me I signed with Phoenix as a free agent so I played all my three years in my contract and at that time you know if you don't go to school you know after your three years then it's tougher and it's, it's a little bit more difficult to get into school. So at that time I knew that I could sit out one year because that's the rules. And then I could still play two years uh, to, to make up my five. So, um, you know, Danny came to, uh, to uh, Peter Rowe sat down, you know, we have mutual family friends once again in the Sioux. Um, you know, I knew Danny from, uh, from, you know, watching and, and uh, in the Sioux and, you know, he came and chatted and, you know, I didn't need to go out for a recruiting trip or anything like that because I knew who he was and I knew what he was all about. And I knew a bunch of the guys that were there as well. Um, so it was a perfect fit. And uh, I headed uh, <laughs> a new direction again, out east uh, to uh, Anaganish, Nova Scotia now. You talked earlier about that kind of decision. Are you going to report to the Peterborough Pete's? Are you going to 
write your SATs. And I feel like this is somewhat similar. Are you going to keep grinding it out and, and working through the pros or are you going to go and, and get into U sports, university hockey, get your education? How, how difficult was it at that point to decide that maybe, you know, an academic path was the one to go on? It was difficult. And that's not a good thing that the, the Pete's do here. Like, you know, we were made, you know, to take courses, even though when you're, even when you're done uh, high school. So, you know, I had um, a bunch of courses under my belt already um, while I was playing in the East coast league. Um, you know, I had it in my contract with Phoenix that the courses that I took that they would pay for them. So I was constantly taking university courses. Um, so I had about a year, um, under my belt already. So I thought, you know what, I might as well, I might as well go and and get my degree. And then if I want to play after I'll I'll go back and play. Um, And just because it's, you know, it's so much easier and and better being a part of a team and and going to university. So, you know, otherwise if I didn't, then I'd just go, I would eventually go to university, but I'd just be going to university to go to school. And I didn't want to do that. I wanted to be part of a team. Um, So, um, you know, after talking to my parents, it was, uh, it was, you know, it's the right thing to do at the time. So let's recap this again, 96 OHL championship with Peterborough. It's 98. I think it was Mississippi and the Kelly cup in the East coast league. Yeah. And then Oh four. Yeah. You're going to win a national championship with St. Effects. Like Marty, are you sure you couldn't have hooked up with a, an expansion team in the show or something? I mean, you're just <laughs> collecting championships out there. <laughs> uh, you know, I was, once again, I was fortunate, put it in the right spot and all those things again, like you, and now I go to this university, little town, Anaganish, you know, I meet all the players, you know, I meet, I know Danny from before and, and you just have that feeling, right. You have the the same sort of, culture values you know that are put in place and you're looking at this thinking okay here we go right we can we can do this again so um yeah no it was, it was uh, that was a great opportunity that's and once again you know winning a championship in juniors is really special and then pro it's 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 special too it's it's a different type of special and then university it's a whole you know different um you know championship as well because now you're playing for peers, right? Like you, these, these people you go to school with, like the football guys are, you know, in the stands and, and all, all kids your age are who's, who's cheering for you, right? Um, so it's a different, that, that was a different uh, motivational factor as well going there. You know, I think about those championships in junior hockey as being pretty darn special just because the window is is so small, right? You get four, maybe five years, depending on where your team's at in the cycle, et cetera. A pro championship's a pro championship, no matter where you're playing. And then I don't know that you could have a better place than St. FX and, and the X ring that comes with it. Oh yeah, no, that was special. I didn't really know too much about Anaganish either until, um, you know, I got there and, and, you know, you see the rich tradition again. And you know, when you step on the ice, you're playing for the alumni that's been there before you. You're playing for that town of Vanaganish just, you know, loves the university and loves their hockey team. So, you know, you're not just playing for the guy sitting across from you in the dressing room. There's there's a lot that goes into that X jersey that uh, that you're playing for. And uh, and that's that's some motivation there, too. Um, you know, and, and the guys we had on that team, it was once again, Danny put together you know, a great group of guys. And, you know, it's a little bit different when you're, when you're at university, you know, cause he had to be, you know, the recruiter, the GM and the coach. Um, and then we had uh, Greg McDonald's assistant coach there too. Who Once again, like those assistant coaches, sometimes they don't get a lot of shout outs and shout outs to them, but uh, you know, he was a key piece in that uh, puzzle as well. And then you add in all the, the student managers, student equipment managers, student trainers, um, you know, and these are all your buddies who are in your classes, right? And, uh, you know, it's, it's sort of like one of those things, it's, uh, it just gains momentum. And when you're at a university like that, you know, as soon as, you know, you start doing well, you know, more people are talking about it and then you're going to the games and all the athletes are supporting each other. And it's, uh, it's quite an experience. 
So here's a Northern Ontario kid from Sault Ste. Marie, plays his junior hockey in Peterborough, one of the best junior hockey markets, into pretty much the deep south in Mississippi <laughs> in the coast. And then, as you mentioned, this whole new chapter begins out on the east coast of Canada in Anaganish. So I don't know, were you just naive or how was how did it come to pass, Mike, that you and Troy Smith, who we affectionately call Bird, ended up in a hotel room in PEI with a stray <laughs> cat. I just, I mean, I have very little detail, but uh, I think you could fill it in. Well, it says <laughs> everything about him because I wasn't going to keep the cat. <laughs> Wait, what? <laughs> so we're all sleeping on a bus and we're going to PEI. I'm, I'm at the back seat and, I'm, and everyone lights out. We're having our pregame nap and uh, I hear something underneath my seat. So it's dark, picture this. And so I look underneath my seat and I see these two beady eyeballs staring at me. <laughs> at the back of a bus, it's dark, everyone's sleeping. I scream and I yell and I, oh, I run right up the, up the aisle and I wake everyone up and they're so, everyone's mad at me. And I was like, there's something living back there. And, and everyone's like, oh, just whatever. I thought I was joking. Sure enough, T-Bird goes back there. I wouldn't, I wouldn't even put my hand under there. I didn't know what it was. He puts his hand out, he grabs it. It was a it was a kitten. Somehow a kitten climbed on the bus. So I I didn't know what to do with it. And T-Bird says, Well, we're gonna keep this thing. I said, We're going on the road. We're not keeping this. You know, we're gonna be in the hotel room. He's like, We'll sneak it in. So he gets the bus to stop at Walmart. We go get kitty litter. I go, Are you kidding me? He buys the cat like three different collars, some toys. So we're in a hotel and we got this cat. Um, I'm allergic to cats and he, I was like, come on. So anyways, they, they ended up taking it back and his name was Bussy and, and T-Bird saved the cat. Good guy. Hey, eh? yeah. No a... wonder he wanted that story told. He sounds like a freaking kitty <laughs> oh, hero now. Oh yeah. Yeah. That's right. Oh, <laughs> he's quite the character. So we were roommates on the road. We had, uh, you know, we had a lot of good times. I, I'm sure he told, I, have you heard about his ability to sleep at the drop of a hat? I may have seen it from time to time when he oh, yeah. was coaching with the Rangers. Oh, yes. boy. He tried to teach me how to do that. It's all a breathing technique. And I was like, come on, d he could He could fall asleep just like that. So he fell asleep like that, and the cat was meowing all night and kept me up. <laughs> yeah, so you're allergic to the cat. It yeah. keeps you up, but he's the hero, buys the kitty litter, oh, the toys, yeah. all that. Yeah. He was <laughs> in the newspaper the next day when we got back to St. Effects with a cat named Bussy. <laughs> That's absolutely fantastic. Yeah. You ended up, Mike, uh, professionally becoming a teacher. How much yeah. of what you took from coaches or those experience from experiences from being part of a team did you take over into your teaching career? Yeah, you know what? There's a lot of transferable skills for sure. Um, you know, being part of a team, um, you know, and, and just – you know, the key thing with those, those championship teams, um, you know, I, I would say cameraman, Mike Williams, you know, those were, you know, probably the, the most offensive guys in that team at Peterborough. And they respected every single person, the fourth line person, you know, the seventh D, the backup goalie. And they made time for every one of those people. And so did, you know, Sean Thornton, tough guy, you know, he made, he made certain that, uh, you know, everyone looked out for each other, everyone. And so that's the same thing in a classroom, right? You have so many different characters, different uh, uh, personalities. And, uh, you know, I, I found, I, I look at it as, as trying to build a championship team, uh, you know, every year in my classroom and getting to know each one of those kids, um, whether they're the, you know, 95% student or they're the student that uh, is struggling and getting a 45, you know. Um, being part of a team and just, you know, getting to know each one of them is so important. And, you know, I, uh, I had the ability to learn that and, and see the success of that in the, in the hockey world. And, you know, I love doing it in the classroom and it's amazing, you know, how much better it is going to school every day, um, as a student and as a teacher, you know, um, once you do form those relationships and get to know those kids. You know, I'm just <laughs> reflecting as you talk about success. And I, I know you kind of touched on this, but the OHL championship, the Kelly Cup, the the University National Men's Hockey Championship. Do you do you, 
can you rank them? Is it like picking a favorite kid? Does one stand out more than another to you? You know what? They don't. They're all, like I said, they're all special in their own unique way. Um, and, you know, I've learned something from every one of those. Right. And, and something that, uh, you know, that's the old saying goes, you know, win with me today, walk with me forever. And, you know, every one of those teams I can call, you know, whoever up, and, uh, you know, I, I could have five guys here at my house, you know, if I ever needed them. And, uh, you know, I, I go to wherever, Kelowna. Well, I have a buddy there that I play with at St. Effects in Kelowna. You know what I mean? It's just, they're all special in, in their own way. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, yeah, it's even more special when you do win a championship with, uh, with a team. Uh, you just have that bond that, uh, that lasts forever. I'm so glad you said five guys over at the house because I would have forgotten otherwise. Pete Dalladay, I sent him a note before you and I started chatting tonight, and he seems to recall, I'm taking you back, I'm jumping the timeline here, but back when you were in Peterborough, but visiting the Sioux, you had everybody over to the family house, the Martone house for a big Italian meal. Yeah, that's right. The bus pulled up and uh, we went to my nonna and nono. So that's my grandparents and uh you know, they had, they had the tables all set up in the kitchen in the basement and, uh, you know, they couldn't, uh, they, they couldn't wait. And, uh, you know, we had, you know, it was, it was great. It was, it was a good production and it was one of my highlights of my uh, junior career. That's for sure. You know, being Italian, just being able to, you know, break bread, have dinner with someone, uh, is special, have people over to your house. It's, uh, it's even more special bringing a whole hockey team over to your grandparents' house to see your family and then for them to feed them. It was, uh, it was amazing. Drummy though, drummy boy, he, we couldn't get out, get him out of there. He wanted a doggy, doggy plate. I think he filled his boots with, with uh, some pasta that night. <laughs> that is amazing. And your grandparents must've loved that opportunity too. Oh yeah. Yeah. They had the homemade wine in the cantina in the basement too. So I think, uh, I think drummy might've had a glass or two of that one. I thought that's what you were going to say. That's no, why you couldn't get I rid didn't of know. him. He's going to sit back with a little bit of red wine, you know? <laughs> <laughs> no, it was good. That was a special, uh, that was a special night. That's for sure. Fantastic stuff. And, and these, these ties that bind, I mean, clearly it's what led to you and me sitting down and having this conversation today. Uh, the connections that you've got in the game that are mutual connections of ours now, uh, you know, they, you stay in touch and the, the conversation, the lines of communication are always open. Yeah. And you have that respect for, it doesn't even have to be someone you play with. Like, you know, you have that respect for guys that you, you played against and you see them, you know, after, you know, and uh, years down the road, it's just, you have that, uh, you know, mutual ground or, you know, common ground that you, you both experience together. Um, you know, it's just one of those things that, uh, like I said, at the start, I mean, this is why you, you sign your kids up early to uh, not, you know, not necessarily to, you know, hopefully someday they, they play in the NHL or, or whatever, they take it as far as they want, but, you know, you learn those life skills in the dress room, you know, on the rink, um, you know, to just they make you kids better students and uh, just better better all round uh, people. It's uh, it's been great getting this chance to sit down with you. I'm I'm so grateful for your time. I hope that as we watch Porter come through this league, maybe we run into each other at a rink one of these days down the road. That would be awesome. That would be awesome. <laughs> Mike, thanks so much for making time to do this with me. Thanks, Mike. Appreciate the time.